Oh, good to be here with you this Sunday morning. You know, I was, uh, I was really enjoying their warmer weather, and I thought, well, maybe, just maybe we're going to have an early spring, and then, well, we look outside again this morning, and what happens, eh? But that's Grand Prairie. Today we're going to be looking at the one another of encouraging, encouraging, to encourage one another. And we're going to be looking at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 11 is the key verse that we're going to be looking at here this morning. So if you like to uh, turn in your scriptures or whatever device you have to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 11, and we'll get onto that just as soon as we pray. So let's bow in a word of prayer. Hmm. Dear me, Father and gracious God, Lord, thank you for this opportunity we have to come and to gather in your name and to worship. Father, we thank you that we can gather in safety, that we can come together and to hear your word, to sing praises to your name, Father, to come together as a congregation and to have fellowship together, Lord, your church having fellowship here today. And Father, as you look into your word here today, Lord, this is your word. And Father, may we hear your word. May we be in a place so we can hear what you have to say here today, Lord. And Father, help me, Lord, to speak your words and not my own. In Jesus' precious name, amen. So let's take a look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 11. It says, Therefore... Encourage one another and build each other up just, in fact, that you are doing. Now, one of the things, every time in Scripture you see a therefore, you always got to go back in Scripture to figure out why it's there, okay? It's all, Paul is one of these, uh, I like Paul, he should have been a lawyer, really, because Paul lays out his case so well. What he does is he goes, because this, this, and this, therefore this must happen, all right? So, in the previous Scriptures, chapter 5, verses 1 to 11, he lays out his case why we should be doing this. And we're going to get into that in a little bit. But first of all, we really need to understand a little bit of Thessalonica, the Thessalonians, the environment these people were, were in. Uh, Thessalonica was a major city in the Roman Empire. It was the gateway into Asia. It was a place where there was a kind of a melting pot of all sorts of different cultures and religions and all that type of stuff all coming together. So it's a really major city in the Roman Empire. A lot of pagan worship, a lot of idol worship, a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of shrines around, a lot of temples around. A lot of things going, a lot of stuff depending, a lot of commerce depending on the temple and the idols and all the rest of that type of commerce. And then come the Christians into this environment who don't have any of those things. They don't go to the temples, they don't buy idols, they don't go to and take part, partake in the temple and what happens at the temple, they don't do that. You know, so they're really segregated from society, and in this particular society, what's happening for them, there is perse persecution happening, and that is where people, when they find out they're Christians, won't sell to them, won't buy from them, all sorts of things like that. Sometimes people are losing jobs, people are being ostracized from society. There's a lot of pressure to give up their faith and come back to the way they were going before and to enjoy all the benefits of the pagan society. So that's kind of what's happening here. And in that environment, Paul writes this letter. And let's take a look at chapter 5, verse 1 to 11, to get an understanding of why we need to encourage each other. And I think you'll find that Paul's type of encouragement is a little different than what we're talking about, than what we normally talk about encouragement. When we normally talk about encouragement, we normally say, well, you know, you did a great job. Keep it up. Keep going, right? We want you to, we want you to, just to keep going. Thank you for doing that. I really appreciate that. That type of encouragement we're thinking of. But I think Paul is thinking of a little differently here. It's more in the line of someone learning how to play the piano. When you first learn to play the piano, like I had three daughters who learned to play the piano, and they eventually got very good. However, that was eventually. At the beginning, it was a lot of 
miss notes, a lot of stuff, but to encourage them to keep on practicing, to keep on doing what they're doing, to keep on keeping on. Just keep trying. It's okay, you'll get it. That type, I think that's what Paul, the encouragement that Paul's talking about here, as we'll see as we read. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. Now, brothers, about times and dates, we do not need to write to you, for you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you, brothers, are not in darkness, so that this day should not surprise you like a thief. You are all sons of the light and sons of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then, let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be alert and self-controlled. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be self-controlled, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with Him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just in fact, you are doing so Paul starts off this section in chapter 5 saying, for days and times we don't have to, wor- we don't have to write to you about it, we don't have to worry about it, because there's only one person who knows when Christ is coming back, and that's God the Father. He's the only one that knows. So we're not going to worry about any of that. We just have to realize that we need to be ready for Him, because He is going to come like a thief in the night, Paul describes. When Christ comes, He's going to come as a thief in the night. Now, how does a thief come? But does a thief come to your door, knock on the door and say, hey, Sean, I'm going to rob your house today at 2.15. Is that okay in the morning? You guys, leave your stuff out for me so I can get it, so I can get it really easy so I have to make, mess the place up. Is he going to do that? Of course not. What's going to happen? Well, Sean's going to be ready for him. The lights are all going to be on. Probably call the police, get a bunch of friends over. I'm going to be waiting for him. Please, uh, uh, the thief is not going to do that. A thief is going to come when you least expect him to come. In fact, it says, it, the Scripture says peace and safety. People are going to say, hey, it's peaceful, it's safe out, everything's going really, really well. And then that's when Christ is going to come again. One of the things, uh, uh, the metaphor that he uses here of a woman in childbirth pain, giving birth to a child, you know, oftentimes we associate that with it's going to be painful. Uh, when Christ comes again, it's going to be very painful. There's a lot of upheaval. A lot of distress is going to be happening. But I'm not sure that's exactly what he's talking about here. I'm really thinking it's more on the line of when a woman is pregnant, there is an inevitability that she is going to give birth. One way or another, she's going to give birth. If you're pregnant, that's what's going to happen. You can't get away from it. It's, it's going to happen one way or another. And I think that's exactly what Paul's saying here is Christ's return is inevitable. It is going to happen. Just like a pregnant woman is going to give birth, Christ is going to come back. That is inevitable. It's going to happen. And it's going to come when we least expect it. And so we need to be prepared for when Christ comes again. And how we prepare ourselves is by encouraging each other to keep on in the faith. Because he calls us brothers and sisters of light. That's who we are. We don't walk in the darkness. We walk in the light. See, one of the things that I, I kind of view church a little differently than most some people do, I guess. And I want you to follow with me a little bit here. Anybody ever watched the show MASH? Anybody used to watch MASH? I'm kind of dating myself a bit. Yeah, a few people out there. Well, MASH stands, stands for Mobile Army Surgical Hospital, okay? It was a sitcom, it was a comedy that they had uh, way back when. And it was quite funny and stuff like that. They had Hawkeye Pierce and Trapper and they had... Uh, Houlihan as the head nurse, and they had a whole bunch of, Radar O'Reilly, a whole bunch of people. 
And it was a funny sitcom. What it was was based on a hospital back in the Korean War. And what it was, it was a mobile army hospital that followed short, close behind the front lines of the battle. So the battle was about five miles away. The hospital was right there. And it kept moving with them. So they, so they didn't have to keep bringing people back so far. What it did, it really saved the lives of a lot of soldiers. Is what it did, because they were able to get emergency surgery very, very quickly, far quicker than they ever done it before. And that's what the whole idea of that is. And that's kind of what I see as church. See, church is not this building. This is the building. We are the church, you and I. When we come together in our small groups, that's the church gathering together. When we gather together in a big group like this, this is the church. We are the church. And this place really needs to be like a mash unit where people can come, can come in from the front lines because if like it or not, believe it or not, we are at war. We are at war with the principalities of this world, with the different philosophies and prejudice of this world. We are at war with, the, with this world because we are children of the light. We are children of God. And our world loves darkness. And so as we go out into our world, as we go out onto the front lines, we get injured. We get hurt. People say things at work that hurt us. People in our families that maybe that don't believe in Christ hurt us, ridicule us. You know, in academic circles... When they find out you're a, you're a Christian, a lot of people look down on you because you're a Christian. They don't think you're all that smart or all that intelligent because you believe in God. You believe in Jesus Christ. You follow Christianity. They really question your, your abilities. And it is that way out in our world today, too. People question, well, you believe in God. Well, that's kind of old-fashioned. All the different things that are happening in our world today and Christianity is fighting against them. They say, well, you know, these, you got to come up with the new ideas. you got to follow along. You can't just listen to this book. This thing is too old. It, is too old. it doesn't have any relevance for today. you got to follow the new stuff. Follow the new stuff. Well, when I was a boy, breakfast, bacon and eggs for breakfast was a great breakfast. Everybody does. That was a good breakfast to have. That's a good, solid breakfast. It's going to see you through the day. When I got into my late teens, early 20s, that was a death sentence. All that cholesterol and fat and all the rest of it, that's, that's going to kill you. All the, it's going to clog up your arteries. It's going to be terrible for you. And then later on, when I got into my 30s and my 40s, all of a sudden, people were saying, you know, protein is really good for breakfast, you know. And eggs, you know, they're full of protein. Following the new stuff. Even out there today, what they call new and enlightened is old, just repackaged, redone, and sold as something new. This is old stuff that keeps going around and around and around. And as we fight against that, as we stand up for the Word of God, we are going to get injured. And this is the place that we need to come together to encourage each other to keep on in our faith, in love, in our salvation. That's what we need to do. That's what this place is. Each one of us here is a doctor, a nurse, and a patient all simultaneously. Before COVID hit in our church, I would, I would see people that would spontaneously break off into small groups after the service, and there'd be a small group over here, a little bit bigger group over here, a small group, yeah, all over the place. And what they're doing is they're praying, along with the people up here front here, they're praying for each other. These are people who are being in triage or helping people who are building people who are there for each other. And that's what the church is supposed to be, there for each other, because we live in a world that doesn't like us, that doesn't like what we stand for. They rather we walked in darkness just like they did than rather than walk in light. You ever, guys ever walk in darkness? Like I was out on a farm one time, no lights, and I pitch black, and I'm trying to walk. I was stumbling and falling. You know, it's not a fun thing. 
know, you, you move very slowly, very carefully. But we don't have to walk in darkness. We have God's Word, the light. We have a light, a guide for this. And one of the things that I really like about Paul, he uses great metaphors. And the metaphor he uses here is a breastplate. And now, a breastplate is a piece of metal that's kind of molded to the body. It's come from the neck down to the waist. And what it does is supposed to protect all the vital organs. So he talks about a breastplate. He talks about the breastplate of faith and of love. And this breastplate is supposed to protect our vital organs. And some Roman, and some uh, of the higher-ups in the Roman Empire, they would have a breastplate, but it would have a six-pack here, and it would just be all really nice. It would be chiseled, like even if they weren't underneath, they were, at, least, at least their armor thought they were chiseled. So it looks good. And it was all about protecting oneself, showing things. Right? And some of them also had a back plate to protect the back as well, and things of that nature. But the breastplate's there is to protect us. That's what faith and love do. They protect us. They protect you and me. And as we come together and to encourage each other, it must be with faith and with love. One of the things that I find really interesting about encouragement is there is a huge hindrance to encouragement. Anybody know what that hindrance might be? What what would hinder encouragement? Well, if you want to encourage me, well, then you first must know what's going on with me. If I need to encourage you, I need to know what's going on, right? I need to know that. And what happens a lot of times is we don't want to say anything. We want to put this front on that everything's fine, everything is great, nothing, I got no problems. You think, you kidding me? I'm doing wonderful. Ever have this happen or see this? You're at home. People are fighting at home. Time to go to church. You all pile in the car. The fight continues in the car. You're driving to church. You come into the church parking lot. Things start to cool down a little bit. And as you go in the park, all of a sudden, they get out, they get out of the car. Everything's quiet. Everything's fine. Everybody's got smiles on their faces, and they walk into church because we've got to present that everything is fine. Why? This is the place where you can be you. It doesn't have to be fine. How are you going to get encouragement? How are you going to get patched up? How are you going to get it get built up so that you can get back out into the fight unless you tell people what's going on? Like, I realize you don't want to just say it to anybody, and that's fine. I get that. But, you got, but have some close people that you can talk to about this, that you can share with. And if you don't have anybody like that, we have our elders. They're up here every Sunday here to pray with you, and they are willing to pray with you, and you can trust these people. But we need to be able to open up and to share with each other. If you're not feeling encouraged, if you're not feeling ready to get out into the world and back into the battle, maybe it's because we're not sharing what we need to. We're not bringing others alongside because the Christian life has never been meant to go by yourself. You always need people to be with you. And that breastplate of faith is what we need to protect ourselves, to put that faith on. And how we grow our faith is by as we come in and we ask about different things, we get challenged about different things, and we get healing from each other. Our faith grows and builds. One of the great things about a body of believers is when you come together, we can question our faith, we can question the Scriptures. I don't understand all of the Bible. I understand lots of it, but there's some parts of it I just don't get. And it's great to be able to talk to people about that and say, what do you think this means? How do we do this? And wrestle with the Word of God. It's okay to do that. That's how faith grows. That's how our protection grows. As our faith faith grows, so and as we understanding grows of God and God's Word, so does our love for God grow. And so our breastplate gets thicker and thicker and protects us more and more from the wiles of the enemy, of the slings of the enemy, of trying to pull us down, trying us to go away from the Word of God. 
That's what it's trying to, that's what our world is trying to do. And of course, Paul uses the helmet of salvation. I, when I was a young man, I bought myself a brand new uh, 1985 Honda Shadow motorcycle, a 750. Had a shaft drive, no belt or, 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 or chain. It was a shaft drive. It was a really great bike. I loved it. Five speed with an overdrive. Anyhow, I drove that bike from Winnipeg to Kamloops and back. And on that drive, I, I have a helmet on. And every once in a while, as I'm driving down the highway, I get a little bang on the head. My head would actually zip back a little bit. And later on, when I stop for gas, stuff like that, take my helmet off, I say, oh, I'm glad that didn't hit me in the head because that was a big bug. That would have hurt. But that's what the helmet's for. It's to protect us. Up here is where we th- is our thoughts and what we think and what we accept and, what, and who we are. This is what it is up here. And the helmet of salvation is to protect us from things that are coming our way, from wiles of the enemy, because the enemy wants to put out these wonderful sounding plans and schemes and all the rest of it that sound so good, but are actually, in reality, terrible. Ever, anybody ever hear of uh, Dr. Spock? He used to be a child psychologist many, many, many years ago. He wrote a book on how to raise children. People followed his book like the Bible. They read it through, they knew it inside and out, and any time they had a problem with one of their children, they'd go and they'd grab that book and they'd read it, and they'd do what he said. About 15, 20 years ago, uh, Dr. Schwach came out and said that his theory of how to raise children was wrong, and that his theories that helped raise one of the most selfish generations he's ever seen. That's just his words when he came out against his own work. Theories. Better. This is a better way of doing things. The Scripture doesn't change, and it is always right. This is our lamp. This is what's going to guide our way. Without this, we walk in darkness. Without this, we don't know our way. Without this, we are acceptable to enemy, to the wilds of the enemy, the arrows and the slings of the enemy. And we have to know that our salvation is through Jesus Christ and through him alone. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's Jesus. There's no one else. And our world would love, want us to believe any way is good. Just pick something and go for it. It's okay. But it's not. And we need to encourage each other to stay on the faith, to stay in the Word of God. That's what we need to do. We need to stay walking in the light and to encourage each other to do that, to encourage each other in our faith, to encourage each other to keep on in our faith and keep on keeping on, as he used to say. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. That is why we are here to encourage each other, to be there for each other, to build each other up, because there are so many things that are trying to take us away from our faith. So many things, oh, this is so old-fashioned, get with the times. It's not anything new, people. It's just stuff recycled and repackaged and, hey, this is new now. It's not. It's still the old stuff. Satan has come up with nothing new. He just keeps recycling his old stuff. The Word of God will keep us from falling for that. The people around you can help you to do that when we come to them and say, I'm struggling right now. I need some help. And we help them by praying with them, being there, listening to them. But sometimes that's the only thing we can do, is listen. 
and be there and love these people. That's all we can do. And we don't have to agree with everybody. Everybody says to love them. I don't have to agree with you to love you as a brother or sister in Christ, and I hope you don't have to agree with everything I say to love me as a brother and sister in Christ. But we still need to love each other. For that is how the people are going to know who we are, that we are Christians. How are they supposed to know we're Christians? The most striking feature is our love for one another. That's how we love people. We love each other. We show grace to each other. We encourage each other. We challenge each other. And we're there for each other. We're there to encourage each other in the Word of God. Like Paul, at the end of his, at this section, verse 11, the last part of verse 11, he says, just as in fact you are doing, Paul knows his people that are doing this. I know you're doing this. I just want to encourage you to keep on doing it. Let's not give it up. Let's keep on getting there. And now that a lot of the restrictions are lifting, we can start doing it the way we used to as well, face-to-face, person-to-person. Let us encourage each other. Let us love each other. Let us help each other in our faith and build it up. Let's help each other to keep on keeping on. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father and gracious God, Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you that you give us your word that lights our path. Thank you that we can question, we can doubt, we can chew on the hard things of Scripture, and we can talk to each other and challenge each other about that. And Father, thank you that you have given us each other to help to build us up, to strengthen us so that we can get out into our world and affect it for you, to show people what it means to know Jesus through our love for them and for each other. Father, be with us now as we go our separate ways, Father. Help us to encourage each other. Help us, Lord, just to be there for each other in all the different ways that we can. We pray all of this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.